Welcome to your Essential Business Briefing. I'm Stephen Carroll, coming up. What does China's slowing economic growth mean for its neighbours and for the region's recovery from COVID-19? Seeking corporate commitments at the COP26 climate conference, we'll speak to the boss of the Fair Trade Foundation about what he's expecting from companies. Plus, the renewable energy revolution taking place off the coast of Scotland. We'll report from the Northern Isles. China's economy barely grew in the last three months as it registered one of its weakest performances in over a decade. The country has been hit by blackouts and a slump in its property sector in recent months. Between July and September, the economy grew by just 0.2% compared to the previous three months. It's almost 5% larger than the same period last year. At the same time, the unemployment rate fell to its lowest level in almost three years. So what does the future look like for the world's second largest economy? Kate Moody's here with more on this. Kate. Stephen, China's central bank says the overall trajectory remains similar to before the pandemic, just at a slower pace. Its economy is set to grow by 8% this year and about 5.6% next year. But the IMF says that recovery remains unbalanced, partly because of the risk of new COVID outbreaks. Supply chain disruptions and high energy prices could drag down the manufacturing industry, while uncertainty in the real estate market, illustrated by the crumbling Evergrande Group, could also destabilize the economy. What about the Asia-Pacific region as a whole? How is it recovering? Well, the pandemic is still ravaging the region, although it does remain the fastest growing part of the world. The IMF scaled back its forecast for growth this year from 7.6% in April to 6.5% in its latest projections. There is a growing gap between developed economies like Australia, Japan and South Korea and the group of emerging economies, which includes China, India and Vietnam. Emerging economies are surging back at a stronger pace, but they're still below their pre-pandemic levels. Indonesia, the Philippines and Thailand are seen as especially weak links because they're so dependent on the still struggling services sector. They're also seeing rising poverty and inequality. On the other hand, activity in India has picked up after the country suffered a deadly surge in COVID cases earlier in the year. What other issues are weighing on growth? Well, the pandemic and vaccination rates remain paramount, but the region is also especially vulnerable to the supply chain problems and raw material shortages which have hit the global economy. Manufacturing across Southeast Asia has stagnated and is still in a downturn. Some of the problems could start easing early next year, although a lack of semiconductors is set to hamper the electronics industry for much longer. On the brighter side, most economists say they aren't as worried about high inflation in the region as they are in, say, Europe or the United States. Okay, Kate Moody, thank you very much. Now, there are just a few days to go until the latest UN climate conference begins in Glasgow. World leaders, businesses and citizens groups will be discussing ways to combat climate change and to meet the goals set out in the Paris Agreement for reducing emissions. Even before the event started, the activist Greta Thunberg said the talks were unlikely to lead to any big changes. One organisation hoping for change is the Fair Trade Foundation, which is bringing a climate pledge for businesses to the summit, seeking commitment to investing in greener supply chains. Let's speak to Michael Gidney, who's the CEO of Fair Trade. Michael, thanks very much for being with us. What is this pledge about and who are you hoping will sign it? Uh, Fair Trade is a coalition um, of farmers and companies and consumers all around the world uh, trying to make trade fair. Um, and ahead of COP26, uh, uh, we are backing the call of 1.8 million fair trade farmers in Latin America, Africa, um, Asia, um, who are calling on uh, the governments who are coming to COP to make good on their climate promises. They promised $100 billion in extra funding to help those on the front line, farmers um, in developing countries, um, just tackle Uh, the climate crisis. Um, And there is behind this um, a powerful coalition of companies who are signing up to a pledge, which we're going to deliver to COP in Glasgow. Um, And these companies are pledging to do their bit. They are investing in uh, their supply chains. They are looking to adapt and mitigate in their own businesses. But they need governments to create a level playing field. That means the additional money that's been promised, the $100 billion a year for poorer countries. And it also means creating the kind of policies that will actually enable a fair, sustainable supply chain for everybody in the future. 
Now, of course, we're hearing a lot about supply chains these days because of disruptions to them. So what is it that's going concretely you're looking for companies to commit to when you say to, to make that those supply chains more sustainable? Well, there are a couple of things, but the first is we just all of us need to have a reality check, you know, so farmers um, at the sharp end of these big global supply chains who grow the food that we do rely on every day are facing a triple whammy, right? So first of all, like us, they are tackling COVID, the health and economic impacts of COVID. Um, but they're also in many cases subject to long term underinvestment in their supply chains. So farmers still do not earn enough of a living income around the world to look after their farms and, and feed their families. So if you look at uh, global coffee, for example, um, price volatility, where coffee is speculated, um, you know, routinely around the world, very often means farmers lose out. So they're underinvested, they are still really struggling to make ends meet. The third area, of course, is they are now expected to adapt to climate change and the climate crisis. And they're on the front line. So in the last couple of years, there have been enormous challenges, natural freak disasters, floods, hurricanes, uh, banana farmers in, in the Dominican Republic, for example, have seen their crops wiped out through floods and then hurricanes. You know, so this is an incredibly volatile and vulnerable situation they find themselves in. But actually, we, all of us as consumers, if you like bananas, if you like drinking tea, if you like drinking coffee, this matters to all of us. And critically, this creates a business supply challenge for those businesses who trade in these products and bring these products to us as consumers. Now, those companies who are signing the pledge are pledging that they will do their bit. They will, they will look to fund farmers fairly in their own supply chain. So they will work with fair trade to ensure that a minimum price and a price guarantee goes to the farmers so they can mitigate some of the risk. But they're also calling on governments to listen to the science and create science-based targets so that all companies have that level playing field in which to operate. There is still too much vagary around some of the numbers. And what we cannot have is the good progress of some undermined by the, the laggards, if you like. We were very used and perhaps have become a bit cynical of big companies making promises uh, about, you know, the green transition being one issue. How can we monitor and trust companies to follow through on promises they're making? Well, you know, one of the things about fair trade is that we're an independent uh, certification scheme, but we trust no one. So we have really rigorous uh, standards, a very rigorous uh, social and environmental, as well as economic set of audits. Um, and we only award the fair trade mark to those companies who comply with those standards. And what we're seeing in that group of companies, and there are more than 5,000 fair trade products around the world now, what we're seeing is companies want to go further. So for example, in the UK, the co-op who have been a champion of fair trade for years, have just put additional funding into uh, a climate change strategy run by fair trade farmers in Africa to help African farmers, and there are more than a million of them, adapt and mitigate to the climate crisis. In the same way, Ben & Jerry's, um, you know, the global ice cream brand, which has been fair trade for years, are going above their fair trade commitments, actually paying the farmers, the cocoa farmers more in order to help them grow their businesses and become more resilient. So we're starting to see a race to the top where companies are using fair trade as a, as a minimum and then going further. And we're really proud to endorse that, but we need more of that kind of energy. So this business pledge is an easy way of companies signing on and saying, yeah, we want to be part of the solution, but we also need governments to play their part. Does this mean consumers paying more for products? doesn't need to at all. So, you know, um, if you think about something like the co-op, um, as I say, which is a huge uh, partner of fair trade, or Ben & Jerry's, um, or a, a, you can get uh, many products from Aldi, from Lidl, right across the world um, in different supermarkets, you don't need to pay more. What this really means is, is companies are looking and they're, and they're seeing that the fact that the climate crisis is, is affecting all of us, um, and they're seeing it's part of their own commercial future. So if you think about it, if you're a, um, a, a big uh, confectioner, you're a big chocolate brand, um, then it's it's a security of supply issue for you. If you can see that the climate crisis is affecting the harvests of cocoa, it's in your business interests to put farmers first so you can have a security of supply and, and provide those products to the market in the future. Okay. So it doesn't need to hit consumers uh, in terms of price. What it does mean is it, it needs a revaluation of the supply chain, of the, of, the, of the price dynamics in the supply chain. But big companies can do that. Okay, Michael Gibney, CEO of Fairtrade, thank you very much for speaking to us.
Now, accelerating the switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy will be another big topic at COP26. On Scotland's Orkney and Shetland Islands, residents are seeing this revolution in action as it's become a hub for green energy innovation. Brian Quinn has more. At the northernmost reaches of the UK, vestiges of an ageing order rust as they wait to be dismantled. Scotland's Shetland and Orkney Islands in the oil-rich North Sea Basin have long been a bastion of fossil fuel extraction. The sector still represents 10% of Scottish GDP. But over the past two decades, production has tumbled by nearly two-thirds, from the equivalent of 140 million tonnes of oil per year down to just 54 million. Faced with dwindling reserves and the climate crisis, Scotland is turning to ambitious startups to power a green energy revolution. One example, this tidal generator prototype that uses undersea currents to produce enough electricity for 2,000 homes. We're happy with it. We're, we're, we're making power with it right now. And um, we think that this, this, this product is scalable. Tidal energy is also behind two other Orkney startups one of which powers electric car charging stations. Another uses tidal electricity and seawater to produce liquid hydrogen that powers ferries at the port of Kirkwall. A lot of people describe Orkney as a living laboratory. and um, We have lots of test sites and various different companies that are all working together um, in, in this sort of green economy that we've got going. Scotland's renewable energy output has tripled in just a decade, but not everyone is electrified by the developments. Many Shetland residents are against plans to open one of the world's largest onshore wind farms. As energy prices surge, offshore oil is still being developed, including at the controversial Cambo field west of Shetland. Scotland, though, has set a goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2045, five years ahead of the UK as a whole. That's all from us for now, but you can find this and all of our previous shows as a podcast wherever you usually listen. And is there a business or economic story you think we should be covering? Let us know on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching.